directed me towards is becoming like him. Um, there's a lot of influence in the world that we live in today to be like the world, to be like uh, things that are not anything about God or like God, but there's not near as much pressure from the world or from the culture that we live in to be like God. There's, if you're going to be like Him, you're going to go against the, the grain. You're going to go against the flow of this world. You're going to have to push with everything you've got to be like Him. It's not just going to happen for us easily. And there's some things that we can do in our life that allow us to live for Him much more successfully. There's some things that we can establish in our life and principles we can live by that will allow us to live for Him and hopefully become like Him before we meet Him, right? And He can help us with that. So I want to I want to talk tonight for sure, maybe uh, some more in the future. We'll see how it goes. But uh, I've titled this lesson tonight, Guardrails. And... I'd like for you to just hang with me all the way through this tonight before you have any preconceived ideas about what it's going to be about or that you've already heard it or anything like that. So just hang with me. I want to pray and ask God to open up our minds and our understanding and then we're going to um, get into lots of the word but not read right off the start. So could you pray with me right now and ask God to help you understand what he has for you tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We pray tonight that, that your spirit would come into this place and you would touch every ear, every heart, every mind, every life. God, that your anointing would flow through tonight and the word of the Lord would minister in this place in a powerful way. God, that you would teach us and lead us and guide us to become more like you, Lord. And we pray your blessing upon this service tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated if you'd be willing to help me out tonight. So there was a cartoon by um, Mike Waters that made its rounds through social media um, Recently, well, I guess it's probably done it several times, but recently it's been seen uh, maybe by you or others. And it's a cartoon of two men standing near this rail fence. And the fence is labeled God's commands. And one of the men says to the other men, I hate being confined by this fence. I hate being confined by this fence, and I'm going to jump over it. And as he jumps over the fence, the other man yells to him and said, That's not a fence. That's a guardrail. And the final frame of this cartoon, you see the jumper going over the side of a cliff. And below the cartoon is the scripture, Proverbs 19 and 16. It says, he that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul. But he that despiseth his ways shall die. Another translation translates it this way. It says, he who keeps the commandment keeps his soul. But he who is careless of conduct will die. Now that's not my word. That's the word of God. There's something to understand about the word of the Lord that God has provided some things in our life, some instruction and some direction and some wisdom from his word that is not meant to confine us and put us in a prison, but it is meant to give us direction and to keep us safe and to keep us from diving off the side of a cliff in life to our own destruction. There's a difference between fences for confinement and fences for safety. 
guardrails for confinement or imprisonment, and guardrails for safety and blessing. As human beings, we constantly push, we constantly protest against any kind of restraints that are put upon us. As children, we usually... Uh, want to ignore the warnings and the admonitions uh, of our parents that, that are placed upon us because we do not recognize the dangers and the issues that we could be facing. So the things that, that our parents put upon us, we want to ignore them as a child and, and, and disregard them because as a kid, we just want to do what we want to do and go where we want to go. And then as teenagers, we buck against the rules and rebel against the authority because we think it's cool to rebel. We think we know better. And as we've gotten older, we realize those people were a lot smarter than they seemed 10 years ago. They've gotten really smart in the last decade. But... As adults, we push the envelope in order to avoid compliance with rules that we dislike because we think that we are either above them or that they are unreasonable. That we think we're beyond those rules and that we have the control, we have the ability to go beyond them, or the right to go beyond them, or we just feel like it's not very, doesn't make much sense, it's not very reasonable. We think we know better, or we have a right as adults. And instead of rebelling against our parents, many times what we are doing is we are rebelling against God or His Word. The irony with that as adults is that we continue to push against restraints, to push against confines, or a better word I like to call from the word direction that God has given us. The boundaries that God's word has placed on us, we continue to push back from that even though times we have already in our life suffered some kind of loss or some kind of consequence due to our lack of compliance to the things that God has established in His Word for us. Are you all with me on that? You understand where I'm coming from? I I felt impressed to spend some time tonight and uh, hopefully in the future about the importance of spiritual guardrails in our lives. You might think this is something that young people or youth would need to hear and they certainly do but at any stage of our life we must be careful to keep guardrails in place to keep us on the straight and narrow to keep us safely navigating through the road of life it's very important for us to understand how important purity is to the Lord and how destructive sin can be in our lives. Can I get an amen to that? Purity is important to God. A pure life before Him is an absolute necessity. And sin is destructive. Whether it's in the life of a teenager, or whether it's in the life of an adult, it is destructive. And if we're going to successfully live a life pleasing and honorable before the Lord, we must become obedient to the commands of the Lord and His Word and become sensitive and submissive to the convictions of His Spirit. We've got to be obedient to His Word and we've got to be sensitive to the convictions that the Spirit um, gives us, for lack of a better word. So, remember, the adversary is seeking whom he may devour. 
The adversary is like a roaring lion going to and fro. He is looking whom he may devour. And that word may there lets me know that he's looking for someone who has let their guard down. That if, if, if we do the things we need to do in our life and if we are living for God, then he doesn't have the authority to take over our life. But when we allow him to, he does have that ability to do that. He, when we let our guard down is when he is allowed to devour that's when he's given an, ad, an, an advantage. That's when he's given an opportunity is when we lower the guard. Genesis 4 and 7 says, Thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Another version of this um, says, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to dominate you, but you must rule over it. The scripture there early in the word of God establishes the principle that sin is always available. That sin is lying at the door. That sin is ready to come in and take residence in our life. And he teaches us that principle early on. And then in James 1, 13 through 16, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And then notice what he says. Do not err, my beloved brethren. James is letting the church know here that lust is is a real thing. That we have desires in our humanity that is going to lead us to things that are going to pull us away from God. Right? Everybody. Nobody is exempt from that. Everybody has that. There's different things for different people, different struggles for different folks. But everybody's going to deal with lust. James is establishing that principle. It is a powerful thing. And he said when... When that lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin has uh, accomplished its work, it brings forth death. And there's a process from us allowing the thought, the lust, to become sin. And then sin's pattern in our life, sin's wage in our life, what it pays in our life, brings forth the death. It's, an, it's a pattern. It's a, uh, it's a cycle. And he's teaching us here that when those things are allowed into our life, this is what their end is. Death. Now that's not going to make everybody shout tonight. But that's what the Word of God establishes. Not what man has established, but what God has established in His Word that if you follow after your own fleshly desires, you're going to live in sin. And then if you live in sin, if you live a sinful lifestyle, the result of that lifestyle is going to end in death. I think that's premature physical death, and I think it's for sure spiritual death that he's talking about there. We've seen that happen in many lives. So that's the process, that's what's going to happen um, if we just live according to our desires. And then we drop down a few more verses in James 1 and 21. And he says, Therefore lay it aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So he's telling us, he's established what sin does. Then he moves on down and he says, So because of what happens... When you live according to your desires, 
you need to make sure that you lay aside all of the worldly things, all the filthiness of flesh. You got to get it out of your life. You got to turn your back on those things. All those wicked and evil things and the things of the flesh, you need to get them out. And he said, and then with humility or meekness, you need to receive the word of God into your life. Because it's going to allow you to understand what is truth and what is a lie in this world. It's going to be the one that that helps you to go beyond the deceit of the enemy and to learn what truth is in your life. And you won't chase after those things that are false, those things that that are not reality that the enemy tries to sell to us. He said, let that implanted word come into you because it's able to save your souls. So it matters how we live. It matters how we live. I said it the other day, and I'll say it again tonight. This living for God is not just an experience. This living for God is a lifestyle. We have advertised for years Come experience Pentecost. And I hope everyone comes and experiences Pentecost. We need the experience of Pentecost. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost as they were in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. We need that. We got to have that. That's part of the new birth experience. That's part of the salvation plan. But it's more than just an experience To live for God. That is the birth. That is the beginning. And then he's the spirit is wanting to lead us into a lifestyle of living for him. So you don't just come and have an experience. You begin to learn from the word about a lifestyle that God has for you. That is a blessed life that is a prosperous life, that is a life that goes beyond what just this world has to offer and leads to eternal life. So it matters very much how we live. 1 Corinthians 9, or 6, verses 9 through 12 talks about this. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, neither nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit. Of our God. Thank God for that. That we can put that into past tense and say, I'm not that anymore. I might have been, but I'm not anymore. Thank God for that. But then I want to go down to verse 12 and I want to point this out. After he says all that, he says this in verse 12. And this is where we're really trying to get tonight. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me but I will not be brought under the power of any. He's saying some things are permissible, but not all things are profitable for me. He's saying all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Another translation says it this way, you say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything. I must not become a slave to anything. That's a pretty good way of saying it. This is why boundaries and guardrails are so important to us. Is because there's some things that we can't nail down in black and white from the word of God to say you cannot do this. There are a lot of those things that's in the Word. But not everything is. And that's why we need some direction 
from the Spirit of God in our personal convictions to help us understand that some of these things may not be spelled out in His Word, but some of them may be something that He is putting in our spirit, may be keeping us safe, may be keeping us from driving off the side of a cliff spiritually. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Let's go a little bit deeper into that here a little bit here tonight. Boundaries in the physical world are easy to see. We can see fences. We can see signs that are up to to tell us do not enter. There's signs some places where manicured lawns and grasses and all of that, and they say, keep off the grass. This is a... Boundary, they do not want you to cross on the other side of that sign. There's uh, walls that are built, you know, beautiful walls. Big walls that people build. Amazing walls that are built. Some of y'all might get that joke. There's concrete barriers down the interstate to keep you from going in certain directions and across the lanes. There's survey pens that are on property uh, boundaries and, and property lines. And they state where one property ends and where another begins. Boundaries in the spiritual world are just as real. They're just as important. They're just more difficult for us to see. A guardrail is a system that is designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous places and off-limit areas. We need guardrails in different places. There's guardrails around bridges. It's when we're in a place when there is little margin for error. There's a guardrail there. There's guardrails around medians many times where people are very close going the opposite directions And there is a guardrail there to make sure that they don't crash into each other. There's sharp curves and deep drop-offs where uh, unexpected changes are are rapidly uh, happening in the road. And and there's a guardrail there to keep you from running off the side of the road. Guardrails notice are not located in the most dangerous place themselves. It's something you really need to remember and understand. The guardrail themselves is not in the most dangerous place. It is moved back from the most dangerous place in a safe place to keep you on the safe path. It's not in The guardrail will do you no good if it's over the side of the cliff attached to the side of the mountain. It has to be up on the shoulder, on the flat place, away from the danger before it can do you any good. Does that make sense? The danger is just beyond the guardrail. The danger is on the other side of the guardrail. It's not where the guardrail is. Guardrails are located in a place of safety to keep us from moving into the most dangerous areas of our life. Guardrails are our margin for error. I'm talking about spiritual guardrails. Some of the greatest regrets in life could have been avoided if there had been a guardrail established in that area of life that kept one from running off the side of the road of life. Amen? This is not anything I expected anyone to shout over tonight. Just so we know. I'm totally okay with that. But I do expect an amen every once in a while, okay? Just so I know you're awake. I can't hear the folks online tonight. I know we got a lot watching online. We thank you for joining us tonight. Praying for your healing. 
But guardrails function as a warning signal for us. There is some damage when we hit a guardrail, but there's not near as much damage as if there was no guardrail and we ran off the side of the road. There's limited damage when guardrails are in place. Guardrails take most of the impact, and you have a small crash rather than a big crash. Guardrails let us have conscience crashes instead of life crashes. They are instructive rather than destructive. Do you see the difference? Because they're in a safe place. When you hit a physical guardrail, you stop before you hit the ditch. But when you hit a moral guardrail, you stop before you commit a sin against God. That's why we need them in place. We can all agree that the ultimate danger areas are obvious in the scripture. But without personal guardrails that the Holy Ghost and the leadership of our pastoral, uh, pastoral ministry has instructed us with, without those personal guardrails in our lives, we will certainly run into danger. You see, good fathers set up guardrails for their children. We don't just let our five, six-year-old play in the road when they want to because we understand the danger of a truck speeding down the road and not seeing them and running over them. They do not comprehend that danger. They do not understand that. And they see the nice smooth surface and the straightaway to ride their bike on or to run down and they think nothing of it. They just see fun. But the parent, the good father, sees the danger. He knows what's coming around the curve. He knows what the child cannot see. And that's how it is with our Heavenly Father. We don't allow our six-year-olds to play in the street because we see, we've seen some stuff and we understand some stuff. We don't allow our 16-year-olds to have their own private life and all of the, to make all their own decisions and hang out with whoever they want to hang out with because we know some things about hanging out with certain people and going to certain places and, and how we might need a little bit of accountability at that time of our life, right? So we put boundaries or guardrails in place to protect them, right? So that we can have a little bit of conflict here instead of having a disaster over there. We can fight a little bit over where the guardrail should be rather than having no guardrail and being crying and in torment over a disaster because we ran off the cliff. Our culture thinks that guardrails are stupid. Our Society that we live in thinks that guardrails are unnecessary in the church world, in the spiritual world. Let everybody make their own decision. Let everybody do their own. It's between them and God. There's a lot of that I agree with. But I also understand that there are some principles in the Word of God that tell us you better have some boundaries. You better have some standards. You better have some guardrails. You better have some convictions to lead you and guide you into places of safety and places of blessing where you can live for God without disaster in your life. Our culture, even in the Christian church many times, or so-called Christian church, I guess you could say, believes that these guardrails are unnecessary, they're dumb, they're outdated. But I want to tell you that that position is dangerous. 
that position is very dangerous. We're not the first generation or even the second to face that issue. Way back in the Old Testament, there was a principle established. If you go back and you read Deuteronomy um, 27 and 17, it establishes this principle that I know it's dealing with something different here, but it, it, it relates. There's a principle that relates here that's very important. Deuteronomy 27 and 17 says, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Right? So cursed is a man that removes his neighbor's landmark, his survey pen, his boundary marker. And then Proverbs 22 and 28 reiterates that. It says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Be very careful, he's saying. Do not move the ancient landmarks, the boundaries, the landmarks, those things that were established by our forefathers of faith, be careful about moving those. Why? Because there's a reason that it was placed there. There was some understanding, there was some prayer, there was some thought, there was some um, insight probably from the Lord that you might not have had about why that boundary was set, why that standard was established, why that principle was laid there. There's a reason that marker's there. There's a reason that a boundary has been set. Be careful about moving those. In Ephesians 5, Apostle Paul gives a list of commandments and instructions that are very, very direct. I want to read verses 1 through 12 quickly just to kind of give you an understanding. And I'm going to read this um, out of a different translation just because there's a lot of words in the King James that you absolutely have to look up to know what they mean. I'm going to save you a little bit of time. I want you to understand in our culture today what this is talking about. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And do not let sexual immorality or any impurity or greed be named among you as these are not proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse joking, which are not fitting. Instead, give thanks. For this you know that no sexually immoral or impure person or one who is greedy or who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's pretty straightforward and direct. All right? Then it goes down in verse 6, and it says, Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Don't participate in the things that please that, that people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. And then in verse 10 it says, Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Carefully select where you set your spiritual boundaries, if I may. Carefully decide where you feel like this is safe, this is not safe. Carefully consider where you set your guardrail. How? In a sinful culture like ours, can we ever hope to live to the standard that Paul is laying out to the Ephesians here? This is very straightforward. 
in the face of everything that the world lives for. He said, how are you going to do that? How can you live in the world but not be of the world? How are you going to do it? Well, he lays it out here for them in the next several verses, beginning with verse 15. And he teaches them some principles that we need to, to glean from here tonight. It says in Ephesians 5 and 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. He said, be careful how you walk. You don't just walk any old way. You be careful how you walk. It's like when you're walking in in somebody's property that has a whole bunch of animals fenced in that property. You careful where you walk. You might step on a landmine. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? You're careful about where you walk. I don't know that that's exactly what Paul meant there, but it, the principle fits. When you're living this life spiritually, you got to walk carefully. You can't just haphazardly walk your way through life going with every urge, every feeling, every desire. you got to be careful about how you walk. Not as fools, but as wise. Be careful how you walk. Walking, walking circumspectly is being careful and wise about how you walk, how you live. Not careless, but careful. It's not asking, is this right? Is this wrong? But it's getting to a place to where we say, is this the wise thing for me to do? Not Is this right or is this wrong? Is this profitable for me? Is this the wise thing for me to do? Is this the wise thing for me to spend my time on today? Talking about growing. Not just staying in the same place, but growing in God. Getting beyond those things that have held us back for years. Is this the wise thing for me to do? Is it profitable for me? Is it expedient for me? Is this safe for me? Right? Ephesians 5 and 16, he goes down there and he says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time, being intentional about how you live. Because you're living, we are living in a dangerous time. We are living in dangerous places spiritually. So we have to be careful and we have to be very considerate of the days that we're living in, redeeming the time. Ephesians 5 and 17 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise. Let me say a little more rude way of saying that. Don't be dumb. Don't be ignorant. But he said, be understanding of what the will of the Lord is. Understand what God's will is. It's God's will that we live out the plan that he has for our lives. How do we do that? Well, we live according to the word of God. We live according to what his word has established is good and right and pleasing for our life to him. That's how you live out His will. You obey His word. And He leads you and guides you into that. And you begin to live in the blessing and the favor and the promises of God. Because you're in covenant with Him. Because you're keeping His word. Because you're living in obedience to Him. Here's the thing. With this particular scripture here, Ephesians 5 and 17. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. Many times... We know what the will of the Lord is because the Spirit of God has already impressed that upon us. We know what God wants us to do. We know what God has convicted us of. God has already put that in our spirit and He's been talking to us about that and it's been rubbing on us and moving on us. And we know what we need to do. 
We know what the will of God is, but we want to rebel against it. We want to push it back. We want to say, no, it doesn't really matter that much. It's not a big deal or, or whatever. We want to put it off. The good things that God has for us. I remember, and I don't want to take a long time and wrap it up here real shortly, but I remember when I was, I guess, I think I was 15 or 16 years old, probably 15, and I had been getting really convicted about getting baptized in Jesus' name. And I knew that I needed to do it. I knew that it was the right thing for me. I knew God was convicting me of that and that He wanted me to do that. But I pushed it back, and I pushed it back. It's a great thing. Why, why would I put that off? Why would I not want to do that? I guess just this pride and this flesh. But I pushed it back. I knew what the will of the Lord was. But that flesh, that humanity was pushing it back. And that's the same thing with us. Many times we know what is right for us. We know what God is convicting us about. It might be something good that we need to do. It might be something bad that we need to stop doing in our life. We need to listen to that. We need to listen to that. When God is prompting you on that. Because He is trying to lead you to a higher place. To another dimension in Him. To where you can know Him better. Where you can become more like Him. And you can be blessed more by Him. Listen to that conviction. Don't deceive yourself. Obey the prompting of the Lord. Because many times we know what's on the other side of the guardrail. We know what's on the other side. We just got to be honest. Do we want to go off the deep end? Do we want to wreck our life? Because that's what's on the other side of it. Listen to His voice. Obey His word. Follow the leading of His Spirit. Amen. Start trying to wrap this up here. We all have the tendency to get as close to the line as we possibly can. Say, well, this, I don't think this is, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I understand that. There's a lot of things there's not anything wrong with. But um, we ask the question, is it really a sin? Is this really a sin? And, and we got to get to the place where we understand that that is not the, the right question to ask. Can I do this without sinning? It's the wrong question to ask. The, the question that we need to be asking, is this the wise thing for me to do? Is this a place of safety in my life that I know that I can walk this way and be safe spiritually? Ephesians 5 and 18 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's the next verse on down in that same chapter Paul says here basically put up a guardrail you put up a guardrail Christians don't drink because it's indulgence leads to a loss of control it leads to a loss of control if you look up excess here it literally means unwholeness it means unsavedness it's not a safe place to live the principle is not just dealing with alcohol here it's dealing with a guardrail in our life stating don't allow yourself to become controlled by things that you have no control over. Don't allow things in your life that, began, that can become excessive to the point to where you are filled with them instead of being filled with His Spirit. He's saying, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with His Spirit. It's not just uh, about being uh, living 
in a pattern of the world and of, of being like the world, but it's saying that God's saying, I have all of these awesome things for you. I have all of these plans. I have all of these blessings that I want to put into your life. But if you're filled with everything else, you're going to have no room for me. You're going to have no place for me. I want you to be filled with the Spirit instead of the things of the world. So put up a guardrail. Anything that leads us toward the indulgence of flesh and uh, toward a lack of control is wrong as a Christian. Anything. It's not just alcohol. It's anything. If it leads us towards a lack of control of our appetites, it's wrong. Our Heavenly Father is against it for the same reason the good Father on this earth that many of you are, are against certain things in your children's lives. Because you know the danger they present. You know the problems they create. You know the issues that are at hand. It's the same thing with our God. He knows where it can lead us. He wants us to be filled with His Spirit. He wants to be the preeminent influence of our life. He wants to be the one that gives us direction, that gives us understanding, and that leads us into places of safety and blessing. I want to wrap it up letting you, uh, letting you understand that there are three types of standards in our life that we will deal with. I hope to talk about these more in detail later. But tonight I just want to put them out there for you. There's biblical standards. There's Bible standards. And these are direct black and white commands of Scripture. We all can read them in our Bible every day. Right and wrong. Black and white. There's biblical standards that are there. They're certain. They're set. They don't change. They don't vary. No matter who you are or what church you go to or who your pastor is, the biblical standards never vary. They're the same. There's also church standards. And these church standards are, are convictions and understandings that the spiritual leadership that you are under has placed as Boundaries and guardrails of safety that they feel is most profitable and appropriate for their congregation. And this is where it differs from church to church. But this is where I think that we better be very careful on where we, when we select a pastor in our life. When we select a church that we're going to be a part of that we be careful to have a leader who has boundaries, guardrails, and standards to live by that are for our safety and our blessing. Can you say amen to that? I want a pastor who will give me direction when I need it. I don't want a pastor who says, man, just do whatever you want to do. It'll be okay. Because I know better than that. I know me too well to know that I have the ability to run it off the side of a cliff. Amen? So I'd love to have a pastor that says this is where the guardrail needs to be for you and your family. Be careful about straying beyond that place that I have established is a safe place. Amen? So that's a church standard. Those deal with contemporary issues that are not spelled out in black and white in the scripture. Things change over time. Um, culture changes. Places change. All of that. People change. All kinds of stuff changes. So you need a man of God in your life that understands what we're dealing with in this age that has direction and understanding from God to help put up appropriate guardrails in your life. And you trust those. And you believe those. Amen? And then finally, there's personal standards. There are our own guardrails that the preacher may have never preached against that you felt the Holy Ghost convicting you about. And you said, they may can get away with that, but that's not something I need to do in my life. It's when 
the scripture hasn't spelled it out in black and white, but the Holy Ghost has spoken to you and said, you don't need to go there, you don't need to do that, you don't need to be around them, you don't need to play over there. Personal standards, personal convictions that God has given us by His Spirit that we should listen to and live by because it's the good Father trying to keep us safe. Amen? Our personal standards should be higher than what the Bible teaches because the Bible is the baseline, is the guideline. Many times your personal standards or every time, they should be higher than those. Your personal standard can never be below the Bible standard. Because you don't get to decide what's right and what's wrong. The words decides that. But if you feel like that even though the Bible hasn't said anything about it, it's wrong for you, you better listen to that voice of the Spirit speaking to you. Does that make sense? So they're always going to be higher than what the biblical standards are. And many times um, the... The church standards are going to be the same way. It's not ever going to be below. If your church standard is below the biblical standard, you need to find you a new church. you got problems. Right? And I'm going to tell you, there's some churches in this day and age that are living below the Bible standard. Hopefully not any apostolic, but there are some churches that are way below the Bible standard. Don't go there. Don't even watch their live stream, okay? It's not good. <laughs> so if the Bible standards or your church's standards are higher than your standards, you need to do some spiritual inventory. And you need to think about where your guardrail needs to be because that guardrail is to try to keep you from wrecking your life. This culture, let's, st let's stand together. I'm going to wrap it up right now. None of us plan to mess up our lives. Has anybody ever planned to mess up your life, to wreck it? But you did anyway. Nobody plans to wreck your life. But the problem is, many times we don't plan to not mess up our lives. These guardrails are meant to help us not mess up our life. You are, when you're establishing boundaries, guardrails, and standards, you are planning to not wreck your life. Does that make sense? This is why we need them. Culture says they're dumb, they're crazy, they're ignorant, you don't need them. But God says... I'm putting them here for your safety. I'm putting them here for your blessing. And I want you to be able to navigate through this road of life without wrecking your life and your family. I'm putting them here for your blessing, for your safety. I don't know about you, but I don't want to drive up Pikes Peak. If you've ever been up Pikes Peak, there's some places they need some guardrails, and they don't have them. But they do have some places that there are some guardrails, and I thank God for those. Because I don't want to drive on something that dangerous without the guardrail. I don't want to drive down the 430 Arkansas River Bridge with no barriers on the side. Because I could probably go down those three lanes without running off. But if I have a blowout or if there's some idiot beside me texting or, or Facebooking, they might run me off. And it's so easy to see in the natural but can we, I pray to God that we can see that in the church, in the spiritual. That God has given these things for safety. And you may think they're unnecessary. You may think they're overboard. But when it comes to our soul salvation, when it comes to our eternal destination, is there anything that is too safe? No one will ever regret having a guardrail that kept you safe, but there are thousands upon thousands more than that that would say, I wish I'd have had the guardrail there. It would have saved me so much trouble. It would have saved my family so much heartache. 
Some of you could testify here in here tonight about those things. God's given them to us for this time, for this culture. And I pray that we would be very careful before we ever move a guardrail, before we ever say it's not necessary, it's not essential. Let's get it out of the way. Let's pray together right now. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for truth that gets through the deceit of the enemy. The enemy would say that these things are ignorant, that these things are not necessary, that these things are not profitable. But God, we know that you have given them to us for our blessing, for our favor, for our safety. You've given them to us that we could walk with you, that we could be more like you, that we could live through this life without wrecking, without having extreme accidents that lead to death spiritually, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to be submitted to your word. Help us to be submitted to the man of God that you placed in our life, the wonderful pastor and leadership that you have given us. And Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, that we would listen to that voice, that when your Spirit moves upon us, that we would not push it back, that we would not put it off, but we would listen to what you are speaking to us, and we would obey. And as we do, I know that we are going to walk in greater anointing. We are going to walk in a greater dimension of which we have ever been as we walk in the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Tonight.